Got it. Thank you, Jake. All right. So uh, lower the crime rate is the title of this one. Uh, the topics are going to be class, race, police, incarceration, crime, the political field, um, you know, topics which have been really active over the past couple of years. So i um, hoping there will be a lot of discussion. So, uh, you know, take some notes about the things that uh, like strike you as something you want to talk about. Um, yeah, and uh, basically we're going to talk about how uh, like our diagnosis as uh, an organization at, in the DSA should generally be um, social policies, our favorites, you know, Medicare for all, jobs guarantee. Um, as, and we'll get to it later, but as kind of like the answer for uh, the root causes of crime uh, while building socialism. Um, so like you probably know that the US has uh, more people in prison uh, than any other comparable country or really like any society that's ever existed in history. Uh, there's not really many that come close. Um, and like one of the things that we're gonna try to make a correction on is like that the reason for that isn't because the US is particularly punitive. Um, like, and we'll get to this later, just wanna kind of lay out the main point that this is uh, more the, the product of a more violent society than a more punitive society. Uh, so we'll get to all that. Um, wanna do like a shout out slide at the top uh, to uh, the people who wrote the articles and worked on the videos that I used as sources, uh, which I'm gonna cite at the end. Adana Usmani uh, who wrote, uh, did liberals give us mass incarceration in uh, the most recent Jackman Magazine? Uh, Benjamin Fogel, who wrote Lower the Crime Rate, uh, William Julius Wilson's um, writing on, um, what's it called? Uh, I've got it written down. Concentrated Disadvantage. Uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, Murray Gottschalk also had an interview that I'm citing, so uh, moving on. Uh, right, so we're taking a look at like a few different um, articles from the, the latest edition of, of Jacobin. Um, the first one being lower the crime rate. So uh, this is like a twist on uh, the title of an essay that came out in 2012 called Raise the Crime Rate, which uh, very provocatively and wrongheadedly, as we're going to get to, um, recommended that the progressive movement uh, stop trying to enact like social policies, the, you know, the things that we usually kind of rally behind, um, and instead just focus on prison abolition. So uh, raise the crime rate was saying, like, uh, you shouldn't care if there's crime happening around you, just put up with it. Um, if you're a real leftist, then you, like, uh, should think that the problems with the prison system are so bad that, uh, it should just be, um, eliminated and then, like, dealing with the consequences of, like, uh, crime around us, like, isn't, isn't something that you should really care about having an answer for. Uh, it's me kind of summarizing. Uh, so yeah, very like provocative, kind of ed edgy, I guess, uh, essay, raise the crime rate. Um, so we'll get a little bit to just kind of the scale of the problem. Um, Seven million Americans live under the control or surveillance of the correctional system. Okay. Uh, so let me just, I'll just give the quote from raise the crime rate um, what Christopher Glazik was calling for and all, uh, just keep moving. So, uh, the quote I, I have, and I'll just use the notes that I have to the best that I can for this section. Uh, he called for the progressive movement to switch gears from healthcare, abortion, gay rights, early education, 
progressive taxation, and any number of other unworthy objectives to abolishing the US prison system. Do I have a graphic? I do have a graphic, okay. Uh, so this is um, just one of a few graphs that I wanna show about um, how there was kind of a peak in violent crime um, from the 70s to the 90s. So uh, this is the only one I had a, a digital copy of. I'm just gonna hold up to my camera. <sighs> Y'all are probably looking at the screen. I don't know if Zoom is gonna make this easy for you, but I'm holding it up to my camera that's showing my face that uh, there's other violent crimes that have really similar patterns uh, peaking through the 70s and 90s and then uh, falling off. Um, so, uh, like one thing that we should be paying attention to that's happening uh, today is an increase in violent crime in uh, some of the country's most vulnerable neighborhoods. So, uh, in 2020, um, there was, okay, in 2020, uh, 21,570 people were murdered in the U.S., the largest single year surge in US history up nearly 5,000 from the year before, and as well as the highest number of gun deaths in a year in history. Uh, so I've just been watching, just from like watching Twitter, I've seen like a lot of different conflicting headlines where like there's a crime shock and no, there's not a crime shock, it's just fake. And it's just right wings trying to make you want to keep police because that's been a hot topic. Um, so the facts there are there that like, uh, in the more vulnerable neighborhoods that there are increases in some kinds of violent crime. So robberies are down, the murders are up. So there's a lot of mixed data. Um, so let's just like take it for a fact that there is some increase, uh, for violent crime for some neighborhoods. Um, so we'll, um, when, it, when we're trying to understand the reason for that, it seems like it could be the pandemic, um, it, which is like a non-economic trigger on a bed of economic hardship. So a better society with more public goods wouldn't be so vulnerable. And uh, we should say it's still down from the 80s and 90s levels. So crucially, there's a perception that crime is getting worse. Let me peek ahead on my next slide. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so I'm just gonna rapid fire through some information real quick about this perception of increasing crime uh, in the current year. So a 2020 Gallup poll found that 78% thought crime had increased over the course of the year, the highest number recorded since 1993. Uh, data showed that crime is still down significantly from 90s levels and that some categories of crime actually decreased. Uh, that doesn't render perceptions about rising crime less politically significant, uh, nor the fact that crime seems more concentrated than ever in poor areas. Uh, polling shows that 86% of all Americans want the police to spend the same amount of time or more in their neighborhood. Uh, but whatever conservatives say, that doesn't mean that there's a budding Blue Lives Matter coalition. So people associate police being taken away with less safety. And uh, I imagine that we'll definitely get into this into the discussion uh, and like what the implications of this are. Uh, so uh, for now, let's just say that the right wing wants to use anxiety about crime to, uh, to like keep the same narrative that like uh, punitive measures are how you deal with crime in a society. Uh, and there's also polling that shows that uh, people want policing to look different from the way that it does. 58% say that policing requires major changes and 79% think police violence is a serious problem. Um, can I call it on a volunteer? Somebody in the chat, let me know if you can read the quote on the next slide for me. And type it in the chat. Yeah. 
All right, Violet, uh, if you would please uh, go ahead, unmute yourself. Awesome. Hi, folks. The stakes are too high to allow the right to define politics of public safety through claiming the only good bandit is a dead bandit or lock them all up as an expression of popular will. Benjamin Fogel, and Magazine. Yep. Thank you very much, Violet. Um, just to continue the rest of the quote, um, indeed, for decades, liberals echoed right-wing approaches to public security, introducing harsher drug laws, building prisons, and pairing worthy aims, such as reducing the number of illegal guns in circulation with racist and anti-poor punitive measures, like, uh, like really steep fines for nonviolent crime, right? Um, so, uh, the, the thrust here is that the right-wing pro-police and carceral narrative is illegitimate as a claim to popular will. Uh, so it's like our task as socialists, as like active members of the working class to uh, like work this messaging or like work our messaging uh, about, about like how to actually deal with crime without just dismissing it as like a right wing concern. Uh, so just to put a pin on that section before we move on, uh, anxiety regarding crime, regarding rising crime, can be used to argue for the necessity of change from the left or the right. Uh, okay, and one more point I'll make is that uh, we should think of violent crime happening in a community as an index of oppression. It's one of the key phrases for this presentation. An index of oppression uh, means that uh, because a population is more oppressed, that that population uh, has larger amount of crime in it. Um, that's it. We'll come back to that for sure. Uh, but just take that an index of oppression. Okay, uh, the next section is going to be shorter. Uh, there's another article in this uh, edition of the magazine called It's Not Just the Drug War uh, to clear up some of the misconceptions about uh, like what are the big factors in uh, this uh, outsized prison population? I'll just read this one. If we released everyone now serving time in state prisons whose primary charge is a drug offense, we would reduce the state prison population by only 20%. It was a pretty dominant narrative that uh, the way that uh, drug offenses are policed uh, is, is unfair and that this is uh, like an important, that that's uh, like something that we should want to change. Like that's one of the things that's on the table today probably is uh, like a reduction in sentencing for drug offenses, but uh, let's just remember that uh, there's many other kinds of crime that make people uh, end up in prison, uh, and we should want sentencing reform for them too. So let me, let me uh, elaborate that. I'll read another quote. We need comprehensive sentencing reform, and not just for drug crimes. We need to roll back these very punitive sentences for people who have committed some pretty serious crimes like homicide. We should abolish life in prison without the possibility for parole. This is a nearly unheard of sentence in Europe. Everyone serving time should be entitled to a meaningful parole review. More generally, as a rule of thumb, we should oppose so-called reforms that are actually powerful adjuncts to the carceral state. Okay, uh, got another one. The lack of a consensus on what caused the alarming increase in violent crime opened up an enormous space to redefine the law and order problem and its solutions. So as we we're talking about before, um, that there's like a right wing way of uh, channeling anxiety about crime. Um, so enemies of civil rights in the 60s, you know, Republicans and Democrats, used anxiety about, about crime to create a negative association between civil rights and crime, unrest, riots, and the transformation of the racial status quo. 
in the 80s and 90s, legislators began tough, uh, piling on tougher sanctions across the board. These included not only stiffer punishments for drug offenses, but also the proliferation of mandatory minimums, three strikes laws, draconian measures of sex offenses, mandatory sentencing guidelines, and life sentences. Uh, so this is one factor in uh, why the US is, has got this enormous prison population. Uh, one of the factors is this punitive turn. Uh, so we're gonna come back to it. Just keep in mind, it's one factor that the US has these um, tougher sanctions, these punitive measures, and that there was a time after the crime wave or after the crime shocks of the 60s and 70s, that's when it got more punitive. Cool, so those are the first two sections. Now we've got one more, which is the main one. Uh, did liberals give us mass incarceration? Okay. Uh, was it conservatives? Was it a conservative project? Or was it liberals that actually laid the foundations for uh, mass incarceration? So I'll go ahead and tell you the answer is that it was both, uh, but we'll have to look closer at what role they played. So uh, let's take a break for a second from this question. We are gonna answer it. Uh, and let's talk about social forces. Uh, so this is kind of the narrative of history um, that I think makes the most sense is that uh, if we have a mass incarceration problem, which we do, then that is the result of social forces. So we're talking about the number of prisoners per population like as a ratio of people in prison to the total population of the US. So uh, what's the bigger driving factor here? Is it because the US is a punitive society or is it because the US is a violent society, right? Like if you multiply these two things together, you would get prisoners per population. Uh, and the answer is that uh, the US is a much more violent society uh, than any other comparable developed nation. It's a little more punitive, but it's much more violent. So it's the more driving factor. Uh, so the easy way to understand this is to compare US and Europe. Uh, the US has five to six times as many murders, but six to seven times as many prisoners. Let's just say it again. This is uh, one of our main points. There's five, six to times, five or six times as many murders in the US uh, to Europe and six to seven times as many prisoners. So it's true that like the, uh, the number of prisoners to violence, the, um, the punitiveness of the society is, uh, you know, it's like five to six divided by six to seven. Um, but like the violence per population, that's just the five to six times as many murders, uh, uh, like stat. Um, so just compared to the rest of the developed world, the U.S. really stands out as a uh, really severely, relatively violent society. Let me see if I'm missing anything. Oh, I missed um, saying that like the US has 5% of the world population and 25% of its prisoners. Uh, so that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about mass incarceration. 5% of the population, 25% of the prisoners. Uh, just another way to express that is that we would be on rate prisoners per population with the rest of the world, uh, if we released about 80% of our prisoners today, that would put us on rate with the rest of the world. Uh, so our incarceration rate is like five times higher than average. Uh, almost no country in history comes close to that. Okay. 
So uh, the explanation for why the US is a more violent society that I'm going with is concentrated disadvantage. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, kind of the history of the US's economic development, uh, what race has to do with it uh, in this slide. So let me make sure I keep my place in my notes. So it's no question whether racism matters in criminal justice outcomes. The question is about like putting a finer point on it about how. So uh, going back to whether we're more punitive or more violent, we are a little more punitive, but the driving thing is the violence. So, uh, so the punitive thing would be racism inside the criminal justice system. And that's the more minor factor compared to uh, compared to like the the factors that lead people to violence. Like, and here we get into like historical racism, which is outside the criminal justice system as the more driving factor. That's what I really want to drive home. That's kind of the main point. Um, it's mainly a problem with racism outside the criminal justice system. And just a stat on, on this uh, for race is that there's a black to white prisoner ratio of five to one. And the African-American population is something like 13% in the US. Um, so uh, let's get into concentrated disadvantage. This uh, has been written about by uh, William Julius Johnson. Uh, why is the U.S. a more violent society? Uh, so there's a lot of race and class segregation, uh, which means people grow up uh, with, uh, people can grow up with less access to public goods. They don't have the same networks. And it has a lot to do with wealth. Like there's less taxes on the rich and there's less social goods in general. And we're going to talk a lot about social goods uh, as we go forward. Um, okay, uh, I've got a couple of graphics to show you again. I got to just hold it up to the camera because I didn't get it digitally. Uh, so this is about how the U.S. is like a world leader in homicide. Uh, this is the 20 most uh, violent countries in the world in terms of homicide. And the U.S. is at the top by a lot. Um, so per 100,000 people, uh, the number is about five for the U.S. And for everybody else, it's like one or less. Um, my other graphic for this one is about... That's it. Okay, so again, looking at like, uh, the, the deadliest countries in the world in terms of homicide. Um, and uh, like, what if you looked at just the population of black men, uh, it would be third from the top behind uh, like El Salvador and Jamaica. Uh, so, so the point of that is that you're like at risk for dying from a homicide if you're a black man in the U.S., as if you were live, you're at risk as if you were living in one of the most dangerous countries in the world, the third from the top. Um, and like in the aggregate, like uh, if you're like like uh, just U.S. somebody in the U.S., like no matter if the uh, like your uh, your race and your gender, then um, like you wouldn't be third from the top. So, so kind of the, we'll get into like the historical development of the US. So, uh, so the United States, like one of the things that makes it so unique is probably that it's the only developed country that used to be a slave society. Like I learned recently, like uh, Brazil actually imported more slaves than the US did. I think the US is second place. Um, and, and the U.S. is just unique in being a highly developed country. 
uh, and having that passed. So, so our narrative on crime is that it's the product of economic factors. Um, and we had this agrarian underclass, which had uh, a significant amount of that agrarian underclass being slaves. Um, so when other countries around the world modernized, industrialized, they used their peasantries. Their peasantries became their workforce in the factories. Uh, our agrarian underclass, largely slaves, did not get those jobs. So like when the US industrialized, it was uh, people from Poland, people from Italy uh, who got those jobs instead. So uh, in the earliest, the early 20th century, there was still significant like uh, black employment in the agrarian sector. And there was a collapse and that was never replaced. Um, let me see. Okay, still not there yet. So uh, when the US, I did that one. Okay, so uh, we have a concern that like if crime is rising today and punitive measures kick into higher gear yet again, because that's been the response in the past. Um, like that's kind of the outcome that we want to prevent. That's the only tool that our government has used. Um, has been like when the, when crime goes up, sentencing and uh, spending on punitive measures, you know, the police and prisons uh, increases. So uh, as a footnote, uh like a lot of people have concern about private prisons and i think that that is overstated um like yeah a, a prison for profit is a totally grotesque concept like which should not exist but it's not a driving factor it's about nine percent or something of prisons so this is like another example of the main point that uh the U.S. being a more punitive society is not the driving factor so much. It's not because of uh, the private prison arrangement uh, or like as an example of something that might be kind of uniquely American uh, and probably means that the punitive system is a little worse, uh, but isn't the driving factor behind mass incarceration. Okay. So uh, moving on into kind of our last section here, um, we're gonna handle the like, was it conservatives or was it liberals that uh, brought about mass incarceration question. Uh, so like take it as one narrative that uh, it was a, like white, largely Southern conservative elite project um, to maintain the system of social control over black people um, that went away with Jim Crow. So like, this is one of the dominant narratives in like Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. Uh, so, or, or people say that it wasn't about race, but that like, you know, you can note that it's uh, these, uh, the mass incarceration statistics uh, don't, uh, that, uh, that like affluent African-Americans aren't affected by that uh, in nearly the same way, really. Uh, so, so that's one, one narrative is that it was conservative elites to create a system of control over black people or over poor people or over poor black people. Uh, so there's a counter narrative that says, uh, really liberals are the ones to blame because, and this is like a critique from the left, uh, and the two um, authors that we're gonna talk about who have written uh, from this angle and we're gonna take it apart, uh, is the two authors are Elizabeth Hinton and Naomi Murakawa, uh, whose books are, for Hinton, it's From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. For Murakawa, it's The First Civil Right, How Liberals Built Prison America. Um, so they're 
their conceit, their like wrong ideas are that liberals concocted the crime wave of the 60s and 70s and that rising crime in African-American communities was fictitious. So these, are, these are both wrong claims. Um, like uh, we know that in the 60s, the homicide, the homicide rate doubled and we know that from like mortality statistics. Um, and as far as rising crime in African-American Afri communities, um, uh, the author of this article points to James Foreman Jr.'s book, Locking Up Our Own, uh, to describe that African-American neighborhoods had increased concern about increasing crime because they were feeling the effects of it every day. Uh, so, so as we're kind of uh, like critiquing and taking apart uh, this argument, like I just want to point out like how callous it is to tell people like, oh yeah, the, the crime that is happening in your community didn't really happen or, or if it was real, then you shouldn't be worried about it or something like that. Um, and I, I think this could be a good discussion uh, after the presentation too. Uh, just consider like the, the psychic toll of knowing that uh, somewhere around you, like somebody went with a gun to go kill somebody. It's shocking, it's heavy. Uh, so it's nothing to dismiss. So yeah, we'll probably come back to that. Um, so to recap, crime did rise. It was concentrated in black communities. And as a last point, liberals paid attention to it because the public did. Uh, so did liberals fail to imagine a response? The answer is going to be no, but they failed to implement it. So we're going to talk about uh, like what liberals were up to when they were addressing crime in the 60s and 70s, or the 60s mainly. Uh, so there was the Kerner Commission and there was the Kotzenbach Commission, uh, which were, were both done by uh, former President Johnson. Um, in the in the context of like the unrest of the 60s. Um, the Kotzenbach was first in, in 65 and then the Kerner in 67, um, convened to study the riots of the 60s, like the long hot summer of 67, uh, which was about Vietnam and police violence against African-Americans and more. It really compares to our moment. I thought that was interesting, but it's too much to squeeze into this presentation. So uh, the Kerner Commission, uh, demanded a massive expansion of federal spending on employment, education, welfare, and housing. So these are those like social democratic answers that actually work as we'll discuss. So they had the right diagnosis. It did not implement it. This was just the suggestion that they made, which was the right suggestion. And we'll talk about why they failed to implement it soon. Um, so the Kerner Commission even recognized that uh, masses of African Americans were untouched by the gains of civil rights. Um, Hinton and Murakawa, who have the argument blaming liberals for failing to imagine, um, uh, right, like, um, so this, this kind of counters where they're coming from, where they're saying that, like, the liberal ideology is inherently racist. I'm disagreeing with that. Um, using the conclusion of the Kerner Commission uh, and its admission that civil rights was not really improving many Black people's lives uh, as evidence. So uh, then just talk a little bit about the Kossenbach Commission, uh, also came from LBJ, um, called Social Programs America's Best Hope of Preventing Crime and Delinquency. So it's spot on. Social programs are the best hope of preventing crime and delinquency. Um, Hinton proposes that the commission diagnose the need for a massive war on crime. It's not so. It was diagnosing um, or uh, prescribing. It was prescribing social programs. So the liberals did not fail to imagine uh, um, an answer to crime, they failed to implement it. Uh, well, so let's go through the Kerner Commission's actual recommendations. Two million new jobs, 
uh, and to battle the employment discrimination, to end educational segregation and increase funding to the ghetto, uh, to expand the safety net for all poor, and to build millions of homes inside and outside the ghetto. So, uh, right, like this is the kind of recommendations that, that we like to see and that we believe um, can actually uh, help in like improving people's lives and preventing people from reaching the point in their life where they will commit a violent crime. Okay, so uh, like as we discussed, there was an actual punitive turn after the uh, crime shock started. Uh, and here's our answer to, was it conservatives or was it liberals? It was both. And it wasn't really uh, determined at the federal level uh, because the police and prisons that hold most most of the weight here are state and local are, sorry are state and local police and prison systems uh, so state and local com comprises 85 uh, percent of American prisoners 86 percent of police officers and 87 percent of law enforcement spending so uh, when the punitive turn happened like who was it liberals or conservatives it was whoever you had locally Okay. And this punitive turn, this like modernization of police departments, this increase uh, in spending on police departments, uh, this would probably not have really mattered in history if we had had those social democratic reforms actually happen. Uh, because those social democratic reforms would have created the conditions for uh, for the conditions that create violence to subside. So that's what I mean when I say it's overshadowed by this unrealized social spending. Um, so like whenever we talk about mass incarceration and how bad like sentencing is and how awful it is that we have so many people who get life sentences, those, those are real problems. Uh, and having a less punitive society would be better and is worthy. And again, the driving thing is, uh, is the violence, not the punitiveness, as much as it's still an important problem and not something that I wanna like underwrite. Okay, uh, this is like our last information slide, we're almost done. So, I just lost my place. Okay, um, even today, the money spent on punitive institutions is far exceeded by money spent on social programs. Today, um, you have about, um, like even today, even today when there's like almost nothing available in terms of like the welfare state and public goods um, and like uh, the state intervention in like uh, healthcare, it's pretty much non-existent or, or like it doesn't really make things a lot better. It's, it's more than non-existent it is a lot of money. Um, like, so the comparison from social spending to police budgets today is 12 to one. In the 60s, things were a lot different. It was more like 60 to 80 times higher, the amount spent on social spending instead of uh, the punitive system. Um, so that's part of the problem, right? Like, uh, uh, the reason, like, like when we have this inexpensive solution, uh, which is uh, to like keep people in prison um, rather than try to create a society that doesn't allow that to happen so much, that that's inexpensive. And we don't really invest in prisoners' lives. We don't invest in rehabilitation. Um, like uh, you can compare to Sweden, which spends something like $200,000 on a prisoner on average. And uh, like by spending so little, we're doing people wrong. So uh, let's talk for a second about uh, A. Philip Randolph's A Freedom Budget for All Americans, uh, which was again in the 60s. Uh, A. Philip Randolph was a leader of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and had many other achievements in the civil rights and labor movements. Uh, and so this was a proposal which was never realized. Would have been great if we would have had it. So um, 
a freedom budget for all Americans kind of represents like the left wing of the civil rights movement. Uh, they proposed a $185 billion budget and it included a job guarantee. Um, and uh, so 185 billion was the price tag on it. And then like half a billion was the amount of spending on police and prisons and the punitive system at the time. So like, or I got that wrong, it's like 5 billion to 185 billion. So like 3% of uh, the cost would be covered if we took all of the funding for police and we put it into social programs, we wouldn't have anywhere near the amount of money that we have because the, sorry, we wouldn't have nearly amount of the money that we need to fund those because uh, we have a bigger problem, which is that we don't tax the rich. And so this is, this is why those social programs are never realized. It's because of capitalism. It's because revenue is in the hands of the rich. So in order to fund a social democratic society and transform things in the direction that we want to, it is absolutely necessary to go after uh, the money that's in the hands of the capitalists, not just the police. Um, that's it. Um, here's the sources, I'll paste these. Uh, so uh, thanks everybody for coming. We're gonna open it up for discussion.